So I'm going to be talking about how do you pull together micro-publications, I'll give an example of one in a minute, into a scalable backend and an integrated reading environment. And this will be reflecting work that, we, that my group uh, at Tufts University has been doing on and off for 40 years. So there's a lot back here. So there, it's really a general question that we're looking at right now. How do you best publish machine actionable curated data with accompanying explanations of the strategic design and of the many judgment calls that were made? Uh, and so this is, I think most disciplines have some variation on this. But this kind of work is actually quite traditional uh, in many areas of the humanities. And I, get, I provide here a book which is old enough to be in the public domain, uh, but its structure is still the state of the art for most publication. And this is a type of publication which is called a commentary. Uh, it, you have the main text up here, and down at the bottom you have various annotations. And if, if first class commentary, the annotations are on the bottom of the page, it makes it a lot easier to use. Uh, but if you look at the components of this, a lot of what goes into this publication are things that would now be uh, converted into some sort of you know, RDF triple, uh, or combination of them. This is a statement that, there's this little word up here, which is hata in Greek. It could also be hosta, a different word. And you would get information about where does that data, this, this reading shows up in these places, this reading shows up in these places. You could probably write quite a lot about why you chose one over the, uh, over the other. The point is, is an annotation. Uh, likewise here, this is the beginning of Plato's Republic, and there's a question of uh, named entity linking. So the Greek says, to the goddess, but what goddess? Uh, and we're pretty confident we know which one it is, but it's, you know, it's not obvious. Uh, and there are people who made their scholarly careers figuring out which Antonius is which uh, in a given letter by knowing social networks in the Roman Republic. Uh, and here, an argument about, or discussion about how to translate a particular phrase, it, it could mean when a man faces the thought that he must die, uh, or when a man thinks himself to be near death. You know, different nuances, and you want to have these linked to, to a translation so you can see the alternatives and see the arguments for them. And then finally, an argument about how you would actually parse the sentence. You know, what words go with what? Uh, how do you construe the grammatical structure? Uh, all of these, in a traditional commentary, you'll get selective comments. People will talk about what they consider to be the most significant edge cases. Uh, but when you move to a digital environment, you're able to go beyond just talking about a handful of cases and to, and to exhaustively annotate your source text. And once you do that, uh, you're able to perform new kinds of quantitative analysis, but you'll also provide new reading tools uh, and are able to open up your sources. Now, I come from a field which calls itself classics, which is uh, a really problematic thing, because most people equate classics uh, with, uh, with Greco-Roman culture, uh, which is not appropriate uh, in the United States. My department, actually, we teach Sanskrit, we teach ancient China, we teach Egypt, I teach you know, uh, uh, pre-colonial West Africa, I'm hoping to get the Papa Vu into one of our classes, so we really make an effort uh, to say, if we're going to use this term, and I'm not wedded to the term, you know, we want to be able to work and show that we're inclusive and try to, to respect the various backgrounds of uh, people in this country. Uh, but language is a huge barrier. You can't even, it's hard enough for students to learn Greek and Latin. Uh, how do I, you know, what we now have are tools that allow them not only to do that, start engaging immediately with these languages, but their poor professors like me can start improving their Arabic, work with Persian, and work with Middle Japanese. So we're really looking at a fundamental change in our relationship to source text, where translations are uh, not a stopping point, but they're an entry point. Uh, into the source text behind, and they have a starting point for interactive inquiry. Uh, so, let's get through. This is an example uh, also of the effect of this 
of annotation on pedagogy. This is the midterm that I gave to my students in second semester Greek yesterday. Uh, it's a classification task. And they have to go through, each of them go through 40 instances, uh, 40 different verbs uh, out of 200 in the first book of the Republic, and to say, you know, classify them linguistically. Uh, this is actually, this challenges them to read, understand the context. Uh, it will also provide a data set about the linguistic usage of Plato that will be used by, in other contexts. So the students realize that what they're producing isn't just something for me to grade, but something which we'll use as a knowledge set that will be repurposed in other places. And then each time they say what kind of a grammatical function there happens at a particular place, the next reader can come along and say, oh, that's what's going on. So these are reading tools as well. But the, the bottom line is, I encourage my students to expect to see these annotations in 50 years. Uh, because one of the advantages of working with some of these sources is that they, they, they are objects of persistent value. Uh, now this is an example of one of the first sort of micro-publication or aggregates, you might call it, that we created. And this was a complete tree bank, complete linguistically annotated version of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, and this is the foundation for modern linguistic research. And it was performed by 22 students, completed in 2009. Uh, and uh, most of the contributors were BA and MA level students. And in my field, uh, which is traditionally hierarchical, where you're, you're not, you don't really have a voice until you can work with English, French, German, and Italian, as well as Latin and Greek. The idea that you're able to do something useful uh, as a BA level student has, is a new idea, uh, by and large, and really a transformative one. And there are a number of projects like this where students have found themselves totally engaged because they can do something useful. And I'll, we'll see a number of them as we go forward. But notice we have down here three credits for every sentence. And the way this worked was uh, two students independently annotated each sentence, and then a senior annotator came and resolved the differences. The, the senior annotator started as a postdoc. It ended up being as a Berkeley undergraduate because the Berkeley undergraduate had demonstrated by her work that she was great at this. We could quantify the fact she was outstanding. Uh, and so you had an instance of merit demonstrated rather than seniority uh, as part of this project. Uh, and this is what the data looks like. And you can see down to the bottom, there's the serialization of, uh, actually, that's, uh, just for a second, that's, uh, uh, that represents the syntactic structure of the, of the opening three words of the, of the Iliad. Uh, and you, if you could, might be able to see OBJ uh, over Manin, that's the object of the verb. So that's a, you call it a tree bank, because when you visualize it, you look, it's a bunch of inverted trees. Uh, this is what it looks like serialized in XML, but you'll see above that we have the identifiers. Uh, for the students. We don't have ORCID identifiers. This is like 2007, 2008 we were doing this. But we know, you know, we can, and you can see below primary and secondary. Those are the primary were the people who did the first pass and the secondary was the person who tested things. Now this, we had our own annotation scheme which was based on the Prague Dependency Tree Bank which is the best thing that was available at the time. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, a newer and I think more useful framework has emerged for doing these annotations called the Universal Dependency Tree Framework. More than 100 languages are represented. So if you learn how to interpret these, these uh, funny annotations, uh, you can see here in UD, you, get, you learn how to work with Greek, then you can work with Russian, you can work with Chinese, you can work with a bunch of languages. There's a lot of leverage you've got out of it. So, and we moved some of our data into UD uh, a few years ago when I was in Germany. Uh, and what happens all of a sudden is our data got picked up uh, in Spacey. Uh, and now someone has gone and done some systematic work 
uh, improving coverage of ancient Greek. Uh, but uh, you know, we found, I, I was shocked to discover I could do dependency parsing of ancient Greek with stanza four years ago, simply because we had moved our data into this other format, made it open, and it got snarfed up along with everything else, not because anyone cared about Greek. So another project's come along and systematically worked on updating our tree bank in, in more carefully into UD. This is an old friend of ours. Uh, and on the top, you can see our format. On the bottom, you can see their format. But the significant thing that's different is there are no credits. They didn't have a way of representing the sentence level credits. Uh, and so, bang, they're gone. Arguably, the, one of the most important elements of it. So, you know, we have, they've updated to refine the data. Uh, now we can compare the Greek, say, the uh, linguistic structure of the Greek with the linguistic structure of translations very, you know, very well. We can, uh, as I mentioned, if you learn how to deal with the UD annotations for Homer, you can read, apply it to 100 languages. But we had no way of preserving the credits. And this is a, a particular instance of obviously a more general problem uh, is we now start to see data circulating from one project to the other in different changing formats and adding data but losing data at the same time. So just a word, we've been working on platforms to manage uh, data like this for a long time. This is a digital library that's been going for 20 years. Still is our, we're, we're still in the process of replacing it. Hopefully we'll have that replacement done this, this calendar year. Uh, but it already integrates annotations from a number of sources, but this is not designed for things like tree banks and some of the other things I'll show. This is a newer platform, uh, and I mention it because it was picked up by Brill. Uh, and so if you, if you use Brill Scholarly Editions, you're using an open source platform, and Brill didn't pay us anything because it's open source, but they produce, but they contributed to the code base. So we have sort of a de facto parallel play collaboration going on here. Uh, and it works with Arabic, and, you know, it's language agnostic. Uh, so the, well, this platform I just showed you was able to do everything you would need for a traditional scholarly edition, uh, but not all the fancy new annotations that are available. And so we had another project called Beyond Translation, uh, where we got support from you know, a number of places. I worked on this with Saeed Chowdhury, and I'm totally bummed out that I can't hear his talk across the hall. Uh, but this was designed to address this problem. Uh, and we have a nice roadmap. Uh, but right now, this is a list of some of the categories of, in, of, of annotation that we weave together, and I'll give you examples of this. But the thing which really came home to me as I was working on this project, and we were used Homeric poetry to start with, because Homeric poetry is, a lot of work has been done on it, there's a lot of open data, and it's an interesting set. And I'm, this is a list of, I think, 15 projects from which we're drawing data. And what's particularly interesting is a lot of this data is round tripping. It's data people took, you know, got from us, they changed it, they added their own data, we get it back, uh, and you can see data moving from one project to another. So this is kind of a spoken wheel representation, but really it's a much more complex set of relationships. And this is the result of 20 years of, of CC licensing. Uh, and what you've got is a living ecosystem that is a lot more complex and rich than even I had imagined. It becomes really clear how rich it is when you actually have to start aggregating all this stuff in, in reality. Uh, but here's an example of uh, integration of uh, two different logics. So there's the triple IF world, which is, represents, it allows you to grab regions of interest on an image, say of a manuscript uh, or any kind of image. And then it's linked here to uh, our textual data, which has its own citation scheme. And once you're into that citation scheme, you can get all the fancy annotations you want, translations, explanations, and so on. Uh, so this is a, you know, our next project will probably be the Shadame uh, on this. But here we're drawing from the Homer Multitext project. Uh, this is a critical edition. 
just an example of how that would work for my conservative colleagues to show, show them, yes, I can give you variant readings. Uh, and this data we can display, but this comes from the digital Latin library uh, that makes its material available under an open license. And their, posi their position is, we're putting in the variant readings, and we'd love other people to go add more value. So this is a good thing from their perspective. Uh, here, this is an automatically generated map uh, illustrating all the places that are referenced in this particular document. And as I read my, as, as I read my way through the Persian Shahnameh, uh, I really would appreciate this. And likewise, when I teach uh, the Timbuktu epics, uh, or Timbuktu chronicles about the Songhai Empire, and they are referencing places that very few of us normally hear about, you really appreciate the ability to go to see what the geographic references are. But this also, uh, we have credits for this, uh, and this was produced by an undergraduate from Furman. Uh, so a guy named Josh Kemp in 2021 did the uh, annotation of, place, of named entities uh, in, I think it was the, in the Iliad for us, and we're able to give those credits to him. Uh, this is a link, the metrical analysis uh, of uh, the Iliad or of Greek poetry. Darker gray means it's a long syllable. Light gray means it's a short syllable. And this allows my students to go, you know, read the poetry as poetry, which is actually really hard to do. And one of my this parts of my midterm exam for my homework class is to record themselves reading Homer as poetry. Uh, I, I make students who don't know Greek do this, and they all, it's amazing how well they do, and there's a sound button on the other side, you can play the recording of it also. Uh, but this again comes from another project, CC licensed uh, by one of the heroes of our field. Uh, we have dictionaries, uh, multiple dictionaries uh, that you can select from, and we can see which words are glossed in which dictionaries. Uh, we actually had, we're almost completely an, a CC or open data, data shop, but one exception is the Cambridge Greek Lexicon, because we uh, got a license from them 20 years ago uh, when they were working, and we provided, uh, one of my a postdoc working with us provided the infrastructure they needed, and they said, okay, sure, you can have access to our commercial lexicon uh, you know, when we're done, and you know, when the people at the time would be dead whatever, it was so far in the future. They actually did give us uh, a copy, not without some pushing. This is an example of an annotation class, which is really, uh, which is usually the, the gateway annotation, and it's called translation alignment. And here you have Persian poetry on the left and an English translation on the right. And I love this example. This was done by a, po by a PhD student of mine uh, from Iran, who worked with me when I was a professor in Germany, right, my, where my Iranian students could get visas. Uh, but the red words are words that are not in the Persian. So you, you may not know any Persian, but if you look at this, you will see that um, a lot has been added. Ho, Saki, pass around and offer the bowl. It's getting intrusive. Uh, and offer the bowl of love for God. Uh, for the burden of love for God, uh, Christian or religious allegory has been added to a poem which is about drinking and sex. So it's been turned into Neoplatonic allegory uh, to make it safe. And this is how it's taught in school in Iran. Uh, and this is an example of a, of an aligned, of a born digital aligned translation done by a student. Uh, and there are all sorts of uses to this, but this is one of my students who graduated a couple of years ago. Uh, this is a, a fundamental component of, a, I think, of a modern scholarly edition. Okay, so I'm gonna skip forward. And this is, let's go through here. This is a grammar. Uh, this is what my students' assignment's gonna turn into. Their midterm will look like this. Uh, when it gets published. And now how do we put all this stuff together? We've, we're pretty happy with the front end that we got. You know, it works well enough. It needs a lot of work, 
but it's there and it's feature complete and it's a little confusing, but it's, it, you know, it, it, it's functional. The back end is a really interesting problem because how do you get the data from all these projects uh, and combine them? How do we, we have instances where people have taken data from us, put it into a, a new format and made many fixes. Uh, many, we have a large dictionary with a lot of errors in it. Many errors have been fixed, but their format's different from ours. How do we unify the corrections, for example? So there's a lot, how do we move data so we can use it without losing things? There's a lot going on. Uh, this is what you, this is the outline of what I was showing you. It's the reading environment. You basically have different modes of reading in the center, and then you have widgets on either side uh, to give you su supplementary information. And then, you know, this is our, uh, how we implement things. So we're really interested in um, anyone who's addressing the same kinds of problems as we are. Uh, I think what we're looking at are, you know, this is how you should publish. And this is where you need to have this kind of data integration. Uh, it, you can't just do PDFs. Uh, and if you're going to reduce something to a PDF without loss, you know, that's an issue often. So, and if you're trying to make the human record available, you need some kind of architecture like this. Uh, and that's what we're struggling on. So, you know, some technical questions. What is being lost and or gained as open data flows across projects? Just a pragmatic question. People are putting things in. If we, what, we, I gave you an example of a dramatically problematic one where the credits went away. Uh, but there's lots of other decisions that are made. What friction happens is we convert data into the Atlas framework. I mean, what are some of the issues that we, that happens if you're trying to bring things into a particular uh, format? And then how can we decentralize uh, our own data curation in an ecosystem that's going to combine various kinds of automated uh, pipelines, including traditional machine learning and now large language models, uh, human contributors of various kinds, uh, including students, members of the public, and uh, at library professionals and advanced researchers. Uh, so there's just, you know, right now, if people have find errors in our digital library, they send us emails. Uh, and then somebody goes to GitHub and fixes it. This is not a good way of, of doing it. Uh, and you know, this, the spelling error we can address, but what's the, how do you, in general, absorb suggestions and identify which ones you have to pay attention to. And so how can we assess quality of contributions at scale, which is what I just said? How can we assess uh, performance of differing tasks on combinations of curated and uncurated data? Put another way, some things like topic modeling or information retrieval work really well with noisy data. Other services don't. Uh, and we'll, we'll always have a lot of noise, noisy data because we will not be able to correct everything. So what, what can we do with the data at our disposal? And then the larger questions, and this is the one which I think is most important. I think we have, what I have seen in the last 15 years in a small but growing body of projects is that when humanities disciplines make the students collaborators, uh, there's a complete change in culture. Uh, and I've been shocked at how much our students can get done when they're, when they're doing something that's going to be useful. Uh, and I, there was you know, the, the Tree Bank project. There's a project that produced an incredibly complicated diplomatic edition of a manuscript with seven kinds of, of commentary in it. Uh, I couldn't believe the students worked on this. They did it mainly as, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as volunteers, uh, how do we support publications and especially student publications that combine machine actionable data and narrative prose, which is basically the first question I asked. And then how does this uh, emergent new discovery and reading environment extend our intellectual ranges? Uh, and so I was able to give my students this year uh, Greek and Latin source texts that were not translated. I said, you, you got Bard, Claude, and GPT. Run them through all three, asked each to explain every single word and tell me what the word, what's really going on. They could all do it. Uh, 
and they could critique uh, the translations, not just view them as God's gift. Uh, and so you can say, well, that's students. Well, I'm now finally able to work with a Persian Shahnameh. Uh, myself, my Persian is, is, is pretty basic. And to my absolute amazement, I'm going to be teaching the tale of the Haike, where the colleague of mine will be doing Homer and, and Haike. Uh, I can engage with middle Japanese. Uh, and I know it's, what I'm getting is pretty good because I can compare the translation uh, that exists and see where it, it differs. Uh, we have seen you know, possibilities for this for, for you know, classical Arabic. I mean, one of the big things we want to emphasize is the, uh, it's called the Islamic Library of West Africa, uh, which is enormous manuscript culture in Arabic script. Some of it is African languages, uh, but a lot of it is uh, original Arabic publication. I teach a class on this. Uh, it's very hard to read. Uh, and things like Spacey and Stanza were not very effective. Uh, now, we actually have much better support uh, to be able to engage with that Arabic directly. And that, if you can engage with that Arabic, that allows us to include subject matter that engages a completely different segment of our population. Uh, and this is much different, allows us to contribute much differently. Uh, all right, I will stop here. And we may have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Thanks. Well, really great to catch up with what's going on. I, on one of your screenshots, um, there was, of course, the book, and then there was a distinction of a card. Yeah. And is this, is this, am I correct in thinking that this is the 1992 CD-ROM hypercard edition of Perseus that is carried forward in the interface? Yeah. I, did we have a card thing? So there is, we put in card breaks, we called them at the time. We broke up some of the text by hand uh, and so that we would have semantically coherent chunks. Uh, and they were called cards. And so we, we started with HyperCard, uh, which made it possible for us to produce the first version of Perseus. I was there with the pre-release version of HyperCard in 1987. Uh, so yes, that's a, I didn't realize it was up there. But, this, but the interesting thing is we're using data that we produced in the 1980s. Uh, so we've been able, you know, our stuff has gotten more valuable over time. Uh, so we haven't had the issue of building. We really worked hard not to build something that was really cool today, but that you couldn't sustain 10 years later. So our stuff never looked as good as some other things. But yes. Yep. And I know you were looking for instance on Google language and explaining the filters and things like that and so on. And uh, you were being, you know, like you talked about hiring speakers uh, to help you to you know, make it more proficient in those languages, which is great. But I just wonder, um, in areas where you don't have those kinds of tools, um, you know, to help and so forth, um, have you explored some like online I think the, the, the new the current generation of large language models is really the most, I've been the most effective and really been shockingly advanced over what I had before. Claude now, Claude 3 is a little better than GPT-4. But these things were before, if I ran classical, my classical Arabic through Space Seeker stands, I got, didn't get much. Uh, now, you know, I get parsing, I get translation. So it's a lot more general. And I'll say that, I teach a course on natural language processing, the human record, and I, was, I show them my students Greek, and I was afraid, well, maybe they're going to feel like I'm prioritizing European stuff. They all say, no, oh, you can do that for Greek. I can do that. I can work in Tagalog with my grandmother, or I can do Malayalam, which is my first language. Everybody says, oh, I get the point. So the generality is something that we look for, but we don't, we'd love to have more resources online as well as in person.
all of the above. Uh, so I, I have a, a secondary appointment in computer science, and I was a professor located in the Department of Computer Science in Germany, though I am not a computer scientist. A number of my students have become computer science professors, and we have a finally have a DH minor at Tufts. That wasn't the 2013, uh, but um, and and. What we find is it's a combination of people who are really hardcore you know, computer scientists like my colleagues David Smith and David Memno and David Bamman, uh, and then there are people like me who are centered somewhere else but have technical proficiency, and so you get a sort of a, a combination of skills, uh, and some people with different language backgrounds and so on. Yes. I think we have, so I, I, am, I have a PhD student who's now a, cl a collaborator uh, named uh, Farnoosh Shamsian who's teaching ancient Greek and Persian. Uh, and it's an exercise in localization because there's nothing in Persian about ancient Greek. So how do you design an ecosystem so that I can be thinking in Persian and I can learn some other, I can think in one language and learn another language and we can replicate this over many different languages. And we have some publications uh, of her work. Her students provided the first, uh, started providing the first direct translations from Greek, things like the opening of the Iliad and then Plato's Crito. Uh, Plato's really important in Iran. Uh, the, the Islamic Republic is an imitation of Plato's Republic. That's why it has a council of guardians uh, and as a philosopher king. So it's actually, you know, uh, Khomeini, his dissertation was on the organon of Aristotle. Uh, but there's no direct, almost no direct translations from Persian, from Greek into Persian, and no infrastructure to study Persian or Greek in, in Persian in Iranian universities. Uh, and so we're working on how do you? So she's published how her students, using translation alignment, were able within one, you know, a semester to start producing translations uh, aligned at the word level, uh, which open up Greek. Is, is so we have more stuff to come. Okay, now I think I think we better end. Thank you very much. Yeah, two minutes, just two minutes. Left.